Hello, my name is Vito Iacovello. I'm the Senior Deputy Editor for Infectious Diseases for Dynamid. It is my great pleasure to be offered the opportunity to present to this esteemed audience today. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected nearly everyone in the world. Included among those are all of our healthcare workers. Today, I'd like to spend a few minutes going over how to select reliable evidence in the COVID-19 pandemic. What I'd like to start with is navigating the COVID-19 information. First, I'd like to go through the Dynamed mission, which is to provide healthcare professionals with the information they need, that being the best available evidence current with critical appraisal, the most recent clinical practice guidelines, and expert guidance that answers clinical questions. That information should be available at the point of care and the healthcare workers workflow and personalized where it is available. We really strive to present rapid time to answer, an easy way to search and format it in a way that's easy for our healthcare workers to read. What I'd like to do today is go through a brief history of COVID-19 in Dynamid. I'd like to briefly talk about the COVID-19 information overload and what we do to try to provide the best evidence-based medicine for our healthcare providers at the point of care. I'll talk about my group and what we do the other publication groups, our drug and device team, as well as our systemic literature surveillance or SLS team, and how they work with not only evidence, but guidelines. I'd like to finally show some of the enhancements we've added and some of the additions we've added to help people provide information to themselves and to their patients. As I'm sure this group is well aware, this all started back in December of 2019. My first orientation was a ProMed from the International Society for Infectious Diseases, which described four cases of unidentified pneumonia in China. On January 3rd, 2020, there were 44 cases. And on January 8th, 2020, the novel coronavirus was identified, termed today SARS-CoV-2. On January 20th, 2020, there were 282 confirmed cases by the World Health Organization. And the next day, the United States Centers for Disease Control identified the first travel-related case in the United States. With this new information in Dynamed, we of course did not have a topic on COVID-19. So on Friday, January 24th, we added a new section under the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. As you can imagine, that was not adequate. And three days later, our team worked quite hard to develop the first COVID-19 topic. Since January 20th, 2020, and I just took a quick snapshot from August 26, 2021, not only do we have the novel coronavirus topic, but we have multiple related topics, including a whole new topic on the management of COVID, which we published just a few months ago, COVID-19 in pediatric patients, COVID-19 in special populations, COVID-19 in patients with cancer, COVID-19 in our patients with cardiovascular disease, COVID-19 in our patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease, COVID-19 in our pregnant persons, and COVID-19 associated coagulopathy. One thing I would like to point out, any healthcare provider who has access to the internet or to the web can get all of these topics completely free of charge by EBSCO and Dynamit. Going into these topics, we try to lay things out in a way that our healthcare providers can get the information they need. This is just a quick snapshot. If we went into the diagnosis section and we clicked on that, 
then we'll see several things, who to test, sample collection and testing, blood tests, imaging studies, additional testing. And if we went into sample testing, we could then see recommendations from professional organizations, sample collection, molecular testing, antigen testing. And if we wanted specifically the recommendations from the WHO or the CDC, we can immediately get those with several clicks. I want to now move into discussing COVID-19 information overload. And I thought this would be a nice slide to just bring this all together. I just took a snapshot again from August 26, 2021, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with lit COVID. It is from the National Institutes of Health, and it is a list of the literature available. On that date, there were nearly 165,000 relevant articles in PubMed. If that's not enough to be daunting to our healthcare providers, this does not include preprints, news articles, and again, news articles are very important because our patients will come to us with news articles. And as I'm sure is the same for many of you, there are institution specific recommendations which may not completely align with recommendations from other organizations. So one of our major tasks today is how do we help healthcare providers get through all this information and manage their patients? What I'd like to do is go through several things that my team does to try to curate this information for our healthcare providers. First, I'll talk about my infectious diseases team. We daily review information from the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. We still follow ProMed closely, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, Physicians First Watch, which sometimes gives us some articles quickly, direct feeds from the National Institutes of Health and other guideline organizations. But that's just my team. Our other publication groups, such as cardiology, hematology, pediatrics, the renal group, they're also at least weekly looking for pertinent information similar to what we do to add to their respective topic. Our drug and device team is a wonderful group of pharmacists and PhDs and MDs who review the new medications and therapeutics. As you can imagine, this has been an incredibly active group in the past year. Not only have new medications and vaccines come up for their review, but also at the beginning, there were many new diagnostic tools that had to be summarized and placed into our topic. Not only did we have the emergency youth authorizations from the United States, but other countries had authorizations under interim orders, authorized for temporary supply, provisional approval, et cetera. Every edition from the drug device team is written by a pharmacist. It is reviewed by an experienced PhD on my team, and then is reviewed for clinical utility by either myself or another clinician. Many of you are aware of our SLS team or our systemic literature surveillance team. This team monitors over 450 medical journals, as well as international and US guideline organizations across 28 specialties. The SLS team works with over 50 medical specialists who screen published research, clinical practice guidelines, both for relevance and impact on clinical decision-making and patient care. The physicians and the methodologists objectively appraise and summarize the clinical trials, clinical practice guidelines, and their impact on patient care. To optimize our literature surveillance, Dynamed and the SLS team has partnered very closely with McMaster University using several things. Search and filtering strategies to help identify studies, in systematic reviews that are scientifically sound, the McMaster Plus database, which provides ratings and comments on newly published 
articles from their global network of more than 8,000 frontline clinicians through the McMaster Online Rating of Evidence or MORE system. In addition, we've been working with McMaster on a novel automated website surveillance tool for guideline organizations. Another very important part of what we do, and as all of you are most familiar with, is critical appraisal. Every study is rigorously and objectively appraised by the team who are all trained in evidence-based medicine. Each study is evaluated for trustworthiness, relevance, and clinical value. The appraisal process enables the application of research into practice. And I'd like to emphasize that. Our team helps go through all of this information to bring the most important and clinically relevant information to the bedside, but again, with an eye on evidence-based medicine and its relevance. We identify sources of bias and communicate this so that the relevant clinical takeaways are there. In practicing physicians and methodologists, objectively appraise the most valid clinical trials and clinical practice guidelines, and then integrate them into Diamond. Many of you may be familiar with our level of evidence rating system, but I thought it would be worth spending a minute to go over. This is our attempt to make it easy to quickly understand the quality of the evidence being reported um, in an evidence summary and the primary rationale behind the rating. Level one is deemed likely reliable, and this is evidence that represents research results that address clinical outcomes and meet an extensive set of quality criteria that minimizes bias. Level two, or mid-level, is evidence that represents research results that address clinical outcomes and demonstrate some method of scientific investigation, but do not meet all of the criteria of level one. Level three, or lacking direct evidence, represents one of two scenarios. The first could be a report that's not based on scientific analysis of clinical outcomes, such as a case series, a case report, or a conclusion that's extrapolated indirectly from scientific studies, or it's the study that addresses um, information that's not a direct clinical outcome, regardless of the scientific rigor. This is just a snapshot to show how this information is laid out for our reader. This is a study on the addition of dexamethasone to standard care may reduce 28-day mortality in patients with COVID-19 receiving respiratory support. It's been designated Dynamed Level 2, and it is a randomized trial from the New England Journal of Medicine from February of 2021. Now, that's the line you see when you first open Dynamed. And then if you click on the Details button, you'll see what is projected on the right. The Dynamed Level 2, or well, why is it a Level 2? Well, it was based on an interim analysis of a randomized trial without blinding and possible selection bias. And then for the reader who would like to know more about the study, we go into detail about the patient population and the um, outcomes. And again, when it's available, we try to give you links to the full text. Other ways we try to help the healthcare provider go through all this information is by displaying evidence synopses. And this is our attempt to summarize many studies. And in this one, you can see several trials evaluating corticosteroids in patients with COVID were terminated early due to results of the recovery trial, suggesting benefit with dexamethasone in raising concerns about randomized patients to placebo. Some of these trials did not reach target enrollment and failed to show statistical significance improvement in outcomes. Then we follow that with many studies, which then the reader can go to if they so desire. Another way we try to bring the information to our readers is to summarize guidelines. 
Here you can see two guideline summaries from the National Institutes of Health on treatment of COVID, one on the monoclonal antibody and one on the management based on disease severity. These guidelines are also updated quite regularly. In addition to full guideline summaries, you will notice many guideline notations or guideline links to hundreds of guideline organizations across the world. And these are all separated by region. We have international guidelines, such as the World Health Organization. We have United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention guidelines. We have Asian guidelines, such as the Taiwan Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Central and South American guidelines, European guidelines, United Kingdom guidelines, Middle Eastern guidelines, and Australia and New Zealand guidelines, to just name a few. And these are updated um, regularly, and new additions are added regularly. The next way we try to handle this information overload or bring reliable information to the provider is to curate information. And this is just one example of a uh, curation for mortality or pro in our prognosis section for COVID. So as you can see from these several bullets, mortality rates due to COVID-19 vary widely with major factors, including severity of disease and age. And then we break it down a little further. Mortality relates by level of care required based on published studies. So for all patients, the mortality is about 0.3 to 2.3%. For patients admitted to the hospital, between 10 and 23%. For patients admitted to the intensive care unit, 26 to 50%. For patients requiring mechanical ventilation or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO, between 37 and 88%. We then follow that with 18 summaries to justify our summary above. And the reader can go to each of these if they want to read about the particular study that showed the 88% mortality in ECMO in mechanically ventilated patients. Just to give you an idea of what we've done so far, as of August 26, 2021, the parent compound uh, topic has been updated over 300 times with alerts, guidelines, and evidence summaries. In addition, though, our supplemental COVID-19 topics have been updated over 250 times with new information, again, new guidelines, new drug alerts, et cetera. If that's not enough for our healthcare providers to handle, we try to add some enhancements to make it um, a little easier to get information or to share that information with their uh, patients. And I'll go through a few things with you. We added some illustrations, and this may not seem important, but the, the illustrations I'm gonna show you were very important to my team. There was so much discussion about the science behind the vaccines and many people really questioning their safety that we thought it would be important to make a detailed illustration with our illustration team on what these vaccines are actually doing. And I'll show you those in a moment. <clears throat> we added just some videos lately. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Dynamed's evidence-based medicine focus, kind of a newsletter. And I'm gonna share some of them that they've written to address some of the key issues in COVID care, as well as <clears throat> some COVID-19 blogs where we can share information with all levels of our readers. And then I'm gonna share with you a link to Dynamed Decisions, again, offered free of charge to help healthcare providers go through the pluses and minuses of vaccines for their patients. But first with the illustrations, our immunologists, I have two in my team, worked with our media department to develop new illustrations to help inform both healthcare providers and patients on how the COVID vaccines actually work. 
first, let's go through the adenovirus vector vaccine technology. And as you can see from the top panel, the vaccine is injected into the deltoid of the patient. The adenovirus infects muscle cells and antigen presenting cells via the clathrin mediated endocytosis and viral particles release DNA into the nucleus. The viral DNA encoding the SARS-CoV-2 spike gene is transcribed into messenger RNA, which is then translated by ribosomes to make the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. The viral proteins then stimulate B cells to make antibodies and are degraded into peptide fragments, which are presented to the MHC1 cells to CD8 T cells and the MH2 cells or complexes to the CD4 T cells. The CD4 T cells help B cells make antibodies. And of course, the CD8 T cells eliminate infected cells. And from this, we get memory B cells and T cells to provide immunity that protects vaccinated individuals from COVID-19. The next illustration I think was much more important. Um, this is just my opinion, but many patients were very confused by the lay literature on what a messenger RNA vaccine does. And I don't know if you had the same experience as we had, but patients really called asking, does this get integrated into my DNA and will it change my children and my grandchildren and my great grandchildren? So we thought this was particularly important. And again, this was an illustration we produce. The messenger RNA vaccine is injected into the deltoid muscle. Within the muscle, the messenger RNA vaccine nanoparticles are taken up by muscle cells and again, antigen presenting cells. The APCs travel to the local lymph nodes to stimulate the immune response. I think this is a good place to just make the comment when our patients talk about the lymph nodes being inflamed, then you can clearly show to them why the lymph nodes are being inflamed. And you can explain that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's the vaccine doing its job. The messenger RNA is translated by cellular ribosomes to make the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And then as above, the viral proteins stimulate B cells to make antibodies and are degraded into peptide fragments that are presented to the MH1 complexes to CD8 cells again, and the MH2 complex is again to CD4 cells. The CD4 cells help with antibody production, the CD8 cells eliminating infected cells. And again, we get memory B cells and T cells providing immunity to those who um, are vaccinated um, from COVID-19. This is an addition that's just been added and it, it's simple, but I think it was important. Many of the house staff in my program, and I'm sure in your program, may not be sure how to properly obtain a nasal pharyngeal specimen. And we just have two short videos which show not only the proper technique to obtain a nasal pharyngeal specimen, but the proper personal protective equipment that that individual should be wearing. In addition, <clears throat> the less um, difficult to do is just how to properly obtain an oral pharyngeal specimen. And these were just added um, this month to our COVID topic. Now talking for a few minutes about the Dynamed's evidence-based medicine focus, here are just a few examples <clears throat> of some of the things that have been published in the EBM newsletter. EBM focus from Dissevere for COVID-19. EBM focus, COVID-19. 10 things you need to know now. EBM focus, black patients may be at increased risk of COVID-19 hospitalizations and death. EBM focus, convalescent plasma for COVID-19. And EBM focus, collateral damage of COVID-19 pandemic stress. And as you know, there are multiple more EBM focus letters which are published, which may either address a specific article or may address a series of articles that are published. From the um, public health group, we have the COVID-19 blogs. 
and I have worked closely with them to develop some of these blogs for our patients, the providers, and for other persons. And these are a few that we undertook. What do you know? Um, what do we know about SARS-CoV-2 reinfection? Long COVID or post-COVID um, or post-acute COVID-19 syndrome or PACS. What does it mean? What are the symptoms? Adenovirus vectored vaccines for COVID-19, how do they work? And again, this I thought was very important. We had the illustration, but this is going right to the patient level of how these vaccines work. And of course, right below it, we did one for messenger RNA vaccines as well. In the last one in the lower left corner, the clinical impact of SARS-CoV-2 variants. And as we all know, this is still a question to be answered. Here are some additional blogs. Antiviral monoclonal antibody therapy for COVID-19, does it work? And as you can imagine, the monoclonal antibody therapy section gets updated regularly. Guidelines are changing sometimes weekly. What have we learned about the clinical progression and recovery of patients with COVID-19? Five research discoveries to impact clinical care during the coronavirus pandemic. In 10 questions, patients are asking their physicians about COVID-19. Many of you may be familiar with the COVID-19 um, vaccine. Uh, we used to call it the option grid. Now they're called um, clinical decision tools. And again, these are free access to anyone. And this one is on the vaccine. And I've kind of mm, layered how the um, grid works, but basically in the top, it has options of no vaccine, the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And of course, there are other vaccines which are used throughout the world, uh, but for uh, the option grid, they opted to um, concentrate on the vaccines that this time had emergency use authorization uh, in the United States. And again, what does the option involve? Okay, the three vaccines or no vaccine. What are the benefits? What are the short-term side effects? And then we go through each one. What are the long-term side effects or harms? What else do I need to know about these vaccines? And where can I get more information? With all of these, again, we're hoping to provide reliable information to the healthcare provider at the point of care. We're trying to go through this incredible myriad of information to bring relevant, evidence-based, current, accurate recommendations to the person at the point of care. I thank you all and hope you all have a great day. Goodbye.